So for anybody who has ever listened to a, a lecture from me before, which is probably very few of you, you know that I, tr I like to be funny in my lectures, or at least try to make them fun and engaging. And this is a lecture on empathy. Seems like maybe the most pleasant topic I've ever been asked to speak on. Uh, so of course I went in exactly the other way, uh, because my work on empathy uh, is focused on uh, it's not been limited to, but focused on a country that is, uh, uh, has gone through conflict and is trying to rebuild itself. Uh, I want to give a heads up before I start tonight that I am talking about difficult things, and with the thought that this is a talk, not a class lecture, I still want to be challenging to some degree. So there is conversation about death and uh, violence and um, lines of division, and I just want you to know that before I get going. More than two years ago now, on the 12th of July, 2016, in a moment of American despair, the ever-simmering heat of this country's racial tensions having boiled over, as it periodically does, into scalding destructive violence, former President George W. Bush, in a concert hall in Dallas, Texas, stepped to the podium and preached a policy of empathy. At times, he said, it seems like the force is pulling us apart are stronger than the forces binding us together. Argument turns too easily into animosity. Disagreement escalates too quickly into dehumanization. Too often, we judge other groups by their worst examples, while judging ourselves by our best intentions. And this has strained our bonds of understanding and common purpose. But at our best, he urged, we practice empathy, imagining ourselves in the lives and circumstances of others. This is the bridge across our nation's deepest divides. When Bush was president, he was a warrior king, and there was something still of the old petulant anger in his delivery that day, in the way he flipped the pages of his speech quickly and hard enough that I thought they might rip right out of his binder. Primarily in that moment, though, Bush had become a preacher, giving a homily to his people, offering, the comfort, offering comfort to his nation, but more so direction. This was a moment of American despair. Across the country, there were folks asking an age-old question, Given all of our differences, given the wide range of human life, our different experiences, our different histories, our different political views, our different voices, our different skin colors, our different languages, the particular life songs we sing, our different desires, our different beliefs, our disparate degrees of power, pain, and privilege, how on earth will we ever manage to live together in harmony, in friendship, in mutual happiness, in the ways that affirm the worth and the life of every living soul? Human diversity, all the different expressions of life that emerge abundant and wondrous from our human experience, is something to celebrate, to taste of and be thankful for, to learn and to grow from, this milieu of possibility and encounter. And yet, as just a historic fact, human beings aren't always good where it comes to our differences. The question is still out there after countless millennia. How can we make sure we all simply survive each other? Given how often we trip over our differences, how do we live together without anyone getting killed? It's 2018, and that's still a question we haven't fully answered yet. And on the day we do, that answer shouldn't satisfy us, because we shouldn't want to merely survive each other. We should want to live together, and live together well, supporting each other, creating the conditions for wonderful lives. How do we do that, given how often we let our differences calcify into social divisions? all those axes and rifts along which we fight and disagree. George Bush didn't offer a final answer to these questions, but of all the things he might have suggested, all the powers of law, money, and force he might have appealed to, all the calls for government action you imagine he could make, what he actually did was charge all of us, the people living in this country, to take up the hard work, the civic virtue of empathy. Empathy is a way to bridge national divides, to live together and hopefully live together well. Bush was speaking at a memorial service for five Dallas police officers killed in the line of duty. Their deaths were the result of a one-man ambush, another mass shooting of the sort we've become all too accustomed to. Except there was something different about this mass shooting, or something different at least about the response. In the United States, mass shootings don't inspire grand memorial services, not services that guest star two presidents at least. As Bush spoke, a wall of dignitaries sat behind him, 
front and center of which were President Obama and First Lady Michelle. Six minutes in, Bush concluded his tidy speech. Then the mayor spoke, then Police Chief David Brown. When Obama stepped up, he spoke for 40 minutes more. It was a day of unusually high pomp and spectacle. The gravity of the moment worked on everyone's faces, pulling their skin down into expressions of grief. The concert hall was transformed into a pious cathedral lined with flags and ceremony, flower bouquets and sorrow. In a balcony level control room, somebody orchestrated camera work and sound. Bush and Obama together embodied a symbolism of American unity, two presidents and their families, mourning as one, Democrat and Republican, black and white. And all around them, other symbols of unity, prayers from a rabbi and a mom and a, or a, mom and a priest, the city's black uh, police chief alongside their white mayor, the great seal embossed on the podium, that eagle with a wingspan wide enough to embrace us all as a reminder that this is the United States. This service was more than a farewell elegy, more than a widely televised eulogy. Uh, what we had here was high political pageantry, a show for the nation, a message for us all. Beyond the sorrow of five officers lost, the Dallas shooting had been the culmination of something bigger. Three feverish days in that hot July when America watched as racially charged violence suddenly and explosively unleashed. Over the two days before, one right after the other, America watched one black man, then another, die at the hands of police unnecessarily. On the 5th of July, it was Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the 6th of July, it was Philando Castile in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. In neither case was such aggression warranted. Sterling was dead in less than 90 seconds. Castile's encounter with a highway patrolman lasted only 52. In both cases, videos were recorded, uploaded, or live streamed, and spread across America at internet speed. It was these deaths that the shooter in Dallas reacted to, mad for a kind of vengeance, self-confessedly looking to kill white police officers. What most Americans knew, what news editor, editors opined over, why Bush and Obama had to go to Dallas, was that these three hot days of summer 2016 were in no way a random coincidental happening. They were the flare-up of a deeper, searing, ever-present fire, burning constantly at the heart of American life a subterranean furnace heat that it seems we're always trying to contain. But ever it simmers and ever it flares. I'm talking, of course, about the pain and injustice, the fear and the hate that revolve in this country around the axis of race. This cruelly American rift of social division, our excuse for too many of our self-incured troubles. In the following days, major newspapers mourned for the families of Dallas's five fallen officers, but primarily they focused on national anxieties. They used language like a nation divided, a country torn, a moment when America was sitting on a power keg and a critical point in the history of the country. Were the loose threads binding the American social fabric in the heat of this violence starting to burn away? President Obama had to respond. The White House knew they had to do something. And that something, again, was to preach empathy to the people. As the New York Times put it, quoting the head of the National Urban League, this president's role and his unique quality is to try to be reassuring and empathetic, to understand the pain both of the victims, of the families of the victims in Baton Rouge and Minnesota, and the pain in Dallas. Obama in the middle. If there was a divide between black communities and police, Obama offered his heart as the big pumping bridge between them. Put yourself in the position of black American families living in a society historically rife with racial prejudice, with a history of being oppressed by the state. Put yourself in the position of police in America with too little resources and too big a job, or their families, paranoid daily for the safety of their loved ones, working the most violent streets in the industrialized world. Empathy, by the way, is kind of Obama's thing. He's been praising and promoting it since he was an Illinois senator, and not merely as something that makes us nice and smiley in our local personal lives, the people that we meet when we're walking down the street. For Obama, empathy is a civic virtue, a profound social good, a sustainer of peace in troubled lands, something that keeps social fabrics together, a crucial element in answering those fundamental questions. How do we live together and live together well? In Jerusalem 2013, he put on the unusual show of an American president urging Israeli students to put themselves in Palestinian shoes and to see the world through Palestinian eyes, a speech that led Boston University, University professor of religion Stephen Prothero to christen Obama the empathy president. Prothero writes, Barack Obama is, for better or worse, an empathetic man who has tried for years to see the world through Republican eyes, even as he has pleaded for Republicans to walk a mile in Democrats' shoes. 
He knows that you need a little empathy all around to get anything done among people with different views. So in Dallas that day, in a moment of American despair, a nation watching its politicians to see what guidance they could offer, Obama, as former President Bush did about 20 minutes before him, preached a policy of empathy to his people, suggesting somehow that this ephemeral thing, this intangible brain action that we may or may not be able to count on, this delicate flower of the psyche, as it's sometimes called, deserves to be heralded from the highest political mountaintops as a force for good, for healing, for unity in our lives. We live in an age now when presidents prescribe empathy as a way for the people to work out our differences, live together, and do it well. So forgive me for starting with uncomfortable things, but to ask the question of empathy is to stare starkly into the face of humanity, half gleaming in the sunlit aura of love, half shadow cast, fearful, furious, murderous. We get humanity wrong if we judge ourselves too cynically. We are creatures of love who long for justice, who strive to know and do what's best for all. We also get humanity wrong when our glasses are rose tinted. We, we scratch, we steal, we're destroying the earth, we starve out others to secure our treasures, then use our reason to justify the deeds. The book of human history is long, and just as many chapters are written in blood as we find written in ink happily scribbled. The question of empathy, the question that ultimately matters, is how our empathy becomes a part of what it takes to live together and live together well. From the vantage point of a kind of realism, given a stark look at the kinds of creatures human beings really are. What we all want to ask of former Presidents Bush and Obama is, why I call for empathy? Can it do any good? Does it have any impact? But I've decided over several years now that those questions are deceptive. There might be direct yes-no answers to them, but I don't know if yes-no answers wind up telling us everything we want to know. The best way to work towards those questions, I've decided, is through a different kind of question still. What does calling for empathy actually entail? The rest of my talk is going to be a pastiche of initial thoughts, initial thoughts, a rough flowing stream of rumination in response to this question. When we call for empathy as a bridge to social divides, what actually does that entail? I'm not offering complete answers here or even a theoretical framework, but hopefully an insight or two will flash with some elusive but truthful pictures to reflect on. <clears throat> No, the heavy stuff. Well, no, I was about to say the heavy stuff done, but actually it's not. <laughs> it just keeps going. In Northern Ireland, there's a great wall, a gargantuan beast of concrete, wire and steel, that worms its way like a writhing stone dragon through the neighborhoods and over the streets of West Belfast. The bulk of its long, segmented belly cleaves this region of the city in two. On one side, there lives the Falls Road community. On the other side, the neighborhood known as the Shankill. They call this the Peace Wall this heavy monstrosity. The peace wall, they call it, though there are 80 or more like them. The wall was the first, and this one's the largest. Those other walls came later. They are its children. Together they carve up most of the city. The peace wall has many jobs. It's a stalwart protector, shielding each neighborhood from the other's bricks and flaming bottles. Over time, it's become an economic provider. The wall is actually a tourist draw. Conflict tourism, they call it. Visitors from other lands pay good money to travel here and snap pictures of it with their iPhones. And in this, the walls also become a minor monument for peace. Before tourists leave, they sign the wall with well wishes, with Bible quotes and Bob Marley lyrics, and most of all, pleas for peace and love. Today, long lengths of the peace wall are covered in colorful ink and murals from local artists dedicated to human harmony. These happy cosmetics, these tattoos etched on its concrete skin, Mask the monster that still lurks beneath them. Get a little closer, touch its impenetrable stone, and you quickly remember that, yes, it is a monster. For all of the jobs the Belfast Peace Wall does, its master task, its key fundamental purpose, is to keep the Catholic side Catholic, the Protestant side Protestant. The Peace Wall, all Peace Walls in Belfast, Northern Ireland, are, straight up, no hiding it, instruments of segregation. They separate people where they eat, work, and live. Irish Catholic on one side, Protestant British on the other. 
Northern Ireland is what political scientists call a deeply divided society. Northern Ireland is what Nor the Northern Irish call a deeply divided society. Northern Ireland might be the model case of a deeply divided society. When English-speaking professors like myself want to study divided societies, Northern Ireland is the most common place for us to go. One of these professors, John Henry White, called it maybe the most heavily studied country on Earth. Only the northeastern tip of the, of the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland, landmass-wise, is smaller than Indiana, with a population of 1.8 million people, almost a million people less than the population of Chicago. From the time of its creation in 1921, most of that population has belonged to one of two identity groups, the Protestants, who culturally and nationally feel themselves to be British, and the Catholics, who culturally and nationally feel themselves to be Irish. Of course, the truth about Northern Irish identity is more complex than that. Just like in America, just like in this room, Northern Irish folks define themselves in all sorts of different ways. When I say Catholic and Protestant tonight, I'm using those terms as a shorthand for a spectrum of identity distinctions that's actually far more complicated. And in that, I know, I wind up alighting some important truths. But for the sake of brevity, I'm giving you a very incomplete picture. Still, there is this binary two-group division that really does define Northern Ireland in fundamental, inescapable ways. Because it's down this particular axis of social division that most of the country's violence, conflict, and struggles have run. So I once watched a scholar named Duncan Morrow, a Northern Irish man, try to explain Northern Ireland to a classroom of American professors. He talked for eight hours and he only got up to 1916. So uh, I can't explain Northern Ireland to you, not in this talk. But what you should know for our purposes is that for reasons of history, the animosity in Northern Ireland has always outsized this tiny island. For reasons of history, the overall relationship between Catholics and Protestants have al has always been tense here. For reasons of history, Irish Catholics were an underclass for a long time not treated with equal rights or respect. For reasons of history, the place cycled in and out of violence, but exploded into unbearable fury at the end of the 1960s. For the last three decades of the 20th century, bullets and bombs and bloodshed became common, a terrible routine for Northern Irish life, particularly in the poorer working areas in the cities. Catholics and Protestants moved away from each other, changing the city shapes, segregating to avoid encounters. The British army rolled in and tried to play peacekeeper, but couldn't stay above the fray and became one of uh, just one more violent combatant. For the first half of my life, the word Belfast was synonymous instantly with the kind of tattered urban war zone that for you today probably only comes to mind when you hear the, a name, for example, of Syria. In the 90s, there were peace talks and a treaty in 98. From there, it took 10 years to get a working government, a government where Protestants and Catholics, former enemies in their slow burning civil war, now shared power and run the country together. But for the last 10 years at least, and maybe the last 20, the understanding has been that Northern Ireland is finally a country at peace. Peace in Northern Ireland, though, in 2018, means a city of walls, beasts of concrete, wire, and steel, physically separating two communities who still live in hate, fear, and resentment. When I think of this wall, I think of smashing into the pavement, of falling off my bike and landing on concrete. That feeling of smacking into hard stone, relentlessly immo immovable, that bone bruising crack, that's the force, that's the mechanism at work to keep Bel Belfastians living together. And they are living together without the old levels of violence. After what came before, that seems a mercy. Still, the Northern Irish ask, are we living together well? I first went to Belfast in 2007, and when I did, I thought the question was, to make peace, do you need empathy? But that question was wrong. I didn't understand peace yet. I didn't understand that words like peace, justice, or empathy can be used to refer to multiple different things. There isn't just one peace. There are pieces of different kinds. Some of them don't require empathy. Some of them desperately do. In Northern Ireland, they have a kind of peace right now where the government is in a working order, where the violence has lessened, where there is law and most people abide by it, where most Catholics and Protestants have agreed to stop fighting about whether Northern Ireland should be Irish or British. This is a kind of peace. 
But what they don't have is a deeper peace. What they don't have is reconciliation, a clearing of all the hate. What they don't have is a Belfast where Catholics and Protestants can cross these walls, can meet without fear. One high-level po politician put it to me this way. We have peace here, but the peace we have is not the original biblical peace. If we think about peace in terms of shalom in the Hebrew tradition, shalom meaning a rich reality of wholeness, to live in balance with yourself and with other human beings, with all of creation, with the cosmos, with the creator. It's a rich, holistic understanding of living in balance, not just with the people, but with all of creation. But what Northern Ireland has, he continued to me, is the Roman notion of Pax, merely a legal order. And that, he says, is a far cry from Shalom. Shalom is a deep, demanding vision of peace, and richly rewarding, I imagine, if you can get it. In Northern Ireland, I came to realize this question of peace is really the fundamental question of how we as humans should live. If the Northern Irish are genuinely content with the kind of peace they have today, propped up by walls, fear and hate festering no less than ever, but with the guns packed away and bombs silenced for now, then this is a peace they don't need empathy for. The answer to the question, does making peace require empathy, is, in this case, no. But if, the, if it's the case that the Northern Irish still suffer, still suffer, and they do, if the Northern Irish want reconciliation and to verge anywhere near Shalom, then only crossing these walls is going to allow that. And crossing these walls means crossing the divides in Northern Ireland that are of mind and culture, the psychosocial divides that feed and propagate their fear. Crossing that divide, I think, will take the hard work of steadily developing empathy, which seems to me essential to this deeper Irish peace. In Northern Ireland, there's also a, magnific a magnificently hopeful statue called Reconciliation Hands Across the Divide. Built in the 1980s, years before the peace treaty, its very form, a plea for empathy before anyone thought it possible. Two figures stand, back straight, arms outstretched. A chasm gapes between them. They look strikingly similar to us, but to the figures themselves, they're at polar opposites. Rooted in their own pedestals, their own homes, they face each other, and in that each figure sees exactly the opposite of what the other sees. Their perspectives, their views, are directly at odds, and they cannot, from where they're standing, see the others, and yet they dare to reach across that divide, without armor, without malice, to touch the other's being, hands just an inch away from clasping. This statue is the expression in brick, in brick and in bronze of the Northern Irish desire for shalom. It's a prescription, a hope, for how Catholics and Protestants should meet each other. In some dark alternate universe, our sculptor made a statue where one figure has a spear running into the other figure's side. Maybe this dark version is called Annihilation, Weapons Across the Chasm. Victory in war, after all, secures a kind of peace. Conflicts do end when you crush your opponent. Thankfully, that's not the peace this sculpture envis envisions. Instead, like Bush and Obama, it suggests a policy of empathy. You'll notice I haven't defined empathy yet, and that's because I can't. There's no single definition and no clear thing, no well-boxed label in your mind to find and call empathy. Like peace, there's no one empathy, but rather multiple things that we put that label on. Or maybe they're all facets of one unfathomably complicated process. C. Daniel Batson, the king of empathy experimenters, catalogs eight different definitions of empathy in use by, by psychologists. We can't pick one and call it the real empathy, he tells us, because all eight are equally true and workable. I quoted Batson on this at a conference once, and Michael Fraser, author of The Enlightenment of Sympathy, scoffed. So Batson says eight, well he's wrong, there's 25. Somewhere in Cyberworld, floating untethered, I couldn't find it because I can't remember the terms to search now, I can't remember what the title is, there's a PhD dissertation that details 52. Empathy, it turns out, is even more complicated than Irish history. Whatever we're trying to get at when we use this term, it's multifaceted and it's, and it's protean. It encompasses biology, emotions, cognition, and culture. It's a process that happens in the brain, but it also necessarily happens between people. And crucially, the effects of having empathy, or our behaviors when we're empathizing, aren't always the same for all of us. 
But if there's a core idea we're trying to get at when we use the word empathy, it's something like what this Northern Irish statue is asking us to consider. Here's a glyph I noticed on the internet this week, somebody's attempt to sketch out a symbol for empathy. Notice this symbol's similarity to the statue. There's a dividing line running through the circle, but then lines from either side reach into the space of the other with branches open, like the hands of the figures in the statue, in a position of receiving. In using the word empathy, we're trying to speak to this amazing, maybe even blessed, capacity we find in ourselves to reach beyond me into the experience, the life, of another. Not so completely that we become the other, or somehow occupy exactly the same mental space. We don't lose ourselves and simply look, succumb to the, another psyche. Still, we can share in the lives of others in profound and meaningful ways. Human beings are not actually isolated within our own mental universes, sat atop lonely towers, watching the millions of other lonely towers but never making contact. It turns out we can reach across the existential separations that distinguish you from me to some degree. Some pieces of you enter me, some pieces of me enter you. And that process of me experiencing you and you experiencing me can happen at many levels. I can feel it in the body, somewhere beneath consciousness. I can see it, grasp it, know it, imaginatively, in my mind. I can, it can resonate in my emotions and feelings, like a vibrating D string when someone else plays a D note. And these experiences of grasping or sharing in the lives of others will be framed, will be defined by our politics and our culture. There's a story about the Northern Irish peace process that I've heard several times from different people. It was during a point when progress had stalled. Things weren't going anywhere. For inspiration and a shakeup, groups from both sides, Catholic and Protestant, flew to South Africa. In the same hotel, on the same floor, still the two groups refused to meet. Worse, one side was furious because they discover the other had more whiskey in their fridges. They weren't being treated fairly. From an outsider's view, the peace talks at times could just degrade into petulance, like they were trying to sink it. What we have to understand is that Catholics and Protestants saw each other or saw the other side as monsters, as terrorists, as killers. The leaders of violent groups who killed people they knew and people they loved. These folks were enemies. For both, the other was an unjust criminal. Compromise seemed ungodly. The stakes couldn't be higher. And because they lived in conditions of war and segregation, Catholics didn't really know Protestants, didn't really meet them, and Protestants didn't really know Catholics. Neither side were really human beings to the other. They saw each other on TV, two-dimensional, half a body. They imagined the other with paranoia, understandably given the conditions, shadowy, evil, hiding in wait for them, armed and heartless. And it was war, so maybe they were hiding in wait. Maybe both sides were. But where Catholics understood and cared about and justified the reasons Catholics were fighting, dying, and killing, where they saw themselves as tortured but virtuous soldiers, they ascribed inhuman non-reasons to why Protestants were fighting, and vice versa Protestants for Catholics. In reality, like the two figures in reconciliation hands across the divide, who are positioned at cross purposes but themselves seem very similar, Catholics and Protestants had, at base, similar motivations. They both wanted Northern Ireland to be their cultural homeland, Irish for Catholics, British for Protestants. They both felt like an embattled minority group threatened by the other. Catholics were a minority in Northern Ireland, Protestants a minority on the island as a whole. They both saw the very existence of the other group as a threat to their being, not just their, their individual lives, but their culture, their existence as a people. They both saw their own violence and killing as justifiable. Both groups insisted they were simply protecting their communities from the tribal inhuman savagery the other group displayed in their bloodlust. These narratives, these dehumanizing views of each other, were as hard to cross in those early peace talks as the concrete peace walls carving up Belfast streets. In an interview with another high-level politician, a Protestant man who was in South Africa for those peace talks, he told me a story about how those walls began to fall. The push, the first spark, that allowed mental divides to start being crossed. It sounds like a story of the humanizing power of empathy. 
Long quote. This is his story. Many of us came from a background of having lost families, uh, members of our families during the conflict. Myself, I had two cousins murdered by the Catholic army in the 1970s and 1980s. So it was a big decision to remain in the peace talks. I recollect when we'd been in South Africa meeting with some of the South African leaders, Nelson Mandela told us something that I think is the truth for all peace processes. And that is, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. Now I served with the army, I was out in the streets taking the Catholic army on. And if you talk to former combatants in a war, I mean the First World War is a classic example. You could have groups of soldiers uh, separated literally by a few hundreds, hundred yards of barbed wire and mud, but no conception that on the other side of that piece of ground there were human beings who had families and thought the same thoughts and did the same things that they did and maybe had similar backgrounds. In war and conflict, people become dehumanized, desensitized, and a successful peace process has to unwind that, unravel that, has to find a way of rehumanizing the discourse. So you see, even your enemies as people who are, have families and a community that they represent. One moment that stands out for me was when a Catholic man talked about his personal experience. His son had gone out one day as part of a gang to murder an officer in the Ulster Defense Regiment, UDR, which was the regiment that I had served in. And when they arrived to shoot this UDR officer, the officer killed the Catholic son. Now I remembered that incident. I recalled it because I, I would have been very pleased that my UDR comrade had killed one of his potential assassins. And yet, as I listened to this Catholic talking about the impact his son's death had on him, I had a real sense of his grief, his sense of loss and pain. And I suppose for the first time, it brought home to me that on both sides of a conflict, there is a human dimension. End quote, right? End of the story. Because I'm a neutral outsider in Northern Ireland, because I want to see shalom for everybody in that region, because I come to the place seeing everybody there as human beings caught up in the tragic thrashing wheels of human spiritual brokenness, it's easy for me to throw flowers in celebration and say, yes, we're all on the same side here, just empathize with each other and you'll learn to live together. It's easy for me to fail to empathize with how hard this move must have been for them and the cost of it to their psyches. We're talking again about people that have killed each other savagely. It's not just fear and hate, it's a sense of injustice that the other side wasn't just the enemy, that they were wrong and deserved their punishments because they were in the wrong. Pretty. Pretty little ring. Misplaced. To get a sense of this in America, I have to go to white supremacy. And maybe the Unite the Right rally that hit Charlottesville last year. Come the end of that rally, with the upheaval and, in the end, death it caused, I couldn't see how to practice my own preaching about empathy. American white supremacists look to me like very dangerous, stupid child creatures. And they are on the wrong side of justice of what's right in a higher sense, if not the law. There's no disputing that here. Against these folks, I might have the same sense of righteous indignation this Protestant politician had against Catholics. So I was struck by a thought from Frank Mink, an ex-neo-Nazi whose biography detailing how he fell in with and out of white supremacy was the basis of the film American History X. Days after the rally, he was interviewed on CNN. He talked about how men get drawn into the ideology, vulnerable, easy targets, usually victimized as youths, in ways that, as males in a macho culture, they can't talk about and find no solace for. Of course, that doesn't excuse at all the direction that they take, and excusing it wasn't Meenick's point. Maybe his point came at the very end, when the anchor person asked how young Nazis can be changed. Well, they just have to become better people, he said. But I can't change them in a sound bite. They have to find out what, a human, what being a human being is. You have to treat them like a human being. When I was one of the bad guys at a rally and people threw bottles at me, I never ducked a bottle and thought, whoa, I need to change my beliefs. That, he said, only made him more calcitrant and defensive. I need people to talk to me as a human being, have a conversation. That's how people start to change. My bringing this up right now feels like a soundbite. The deeper how, 
how dialoguing with white supremacists inspire, might inspire their change is unclear to me. How long and hard would those talks be? How much unbearable commitment would I have to muster? How disgusted would I feel for entertaining conversations with these monsters? How much would I rush to the shower afterwards and scrub my itchy, tainted skin? It would feel as disgusting and unbearable, I think, as it would have felt for Catholics and Protestants when they first started peace talks. What a nauseating, immoral suggestion this suddenly seems, this declaration from the great Nelson Mandela. Reach across those hardest chasms. We don't make peace with our friends. We make peace with our enemies. How vomit-inducing and morally reprehensible. How obviously unwise from Mandela, the great pillar of wise morality himself. So I don't know how hard that work of empathy actually is. I observe and I pontificate and I don't think I've really done much of it myself. But I have seen some evidence of empathetic dialogue as a means for change in Northern Ireland. And though it's from Netflix and one-time anecdotal evidence, I watched a documentary recently where a Muslim English journalist filmed the time she spent with three American white supremacists. By the end of the film, one supremacist hadn't, hadn't changed. One shifted at least to say, after meeting you, I've got nothing against Muslims. And one quit the movement entirely, citing his time with the journalist, getting to know her as a human being, for his realization that he could no longer stand to be racist. So it was fully like 50-50, right? Um, sometimes the call for empathy is criticized as sentimental and unrealistic, quixotic and naive. But this might be how empathy work proves almost unbearably pragmatic. To dialogue for the sake of understanding, for the sake of entering into the perspective of a person as vile as white supremacists, who you know are on the wrong side of morality and you suspect might actually be out of their minds. How much safer to sit in the halls of academe where I can simply write papers that prove the unreasonableness of any given white supremacist position. But has lecturing a person on why their moral logic doesn't work ever really managed to change them? Or is that just the intellectual's version of throwing bottles? How much I applaud the Northern Irish for dialoguing in the spirit of empathy with their enemy for the sake of moving, even if at a glacial pace, towards a better society. How sickeningly impossible the thought is of doing it with my own enemies. I'm running out of time, and I still want to make three points. Uh, yeah, and maybe one more quick final summation. So I need to be quick. Here's one of the empathy questions I most often hear. How do we cultivate it? How do we make more of it? How do we get more people to empathize? And I'm not sure those questions are how we should approach it. The implication with those questions is that of a half-empty pool. Our problem is a question of amount. People don't have enough empathy. We need to fill that pool up. And I don't know, that might well be the case. But it's also the case, and this I think is how we should see it first, that people tend to be empathizing all the time. The question becomes, with who? How do we portion our empathy out? Who gets it and who doesn't? If it's a question of amount, then it looks like one of Northern Ireland's key problems is a lack of empathy. There's too much fear and hate there, not enough empathy to go around. And if we could somehow brew more in our empathy cauldron, higher levels of empathy could act as a bulwark against this antisocial expression of fear, hate, and mistrust. But empathy abounds in the Northern Irish conflict. It's everywhere to be found. I trip over empathy whenever I go there. Ask any member of the Catholic or Protestant local armies why they signed up, usually in their teens, and they'll tell you it was because their friend had a father or a brother gunned down by the other side, or to protect their community from the harm they know the other side is willing to bring. They engaged in the violence and have continued with the hate exactly because they empathize so strongly with their own communities, the people of their own identity group. They're driven by a kind of empathetic anger, a sense of righteous indignation, or care for the welfare of their people, to the point that they're willing to sacrifice their souls by killing others, or their lives by getting killed themselves. That's an intense kind of empathy. It dominates their motivations. The problem here isn't too little empathy. It's the way that empathy is arranged. 
So too, when Reverend Harold Good, pastor and peacemaker extraordinaire, held intimate, informal, constant peace talks between Protestants and Catholics in his living room over tea, simply letting them talk to one another, the line he repeated to me in an interview over and over is, peacemaking is tea making. He wasn't cultivating empathy in minds that suffered from too little. He was trying to reorder, rearrange that empathy already at play in their neurons to aim it across the Catholic Protestant divide rather than to jealously hoard it all on one side. My first quick point here near the end of my talk tonight, one thing that's entailed in the call for empathy isn't simply to try and make more, but to shift and rearrange the abundance we already have. We have to think consciously and work hard at the social organization of our empathy, purposely shaping it in ways that help us live better lives together. Another point. That organization means not just rearranging the empathy in our heads, but reshaping the ideas and narratives out there in the culture. Or rather, it means recognizing that the out there of wider culture and the in here inside your brain aren't actually all that distinct. That your deepest thoughts are indeed shaped by wider culture, even as you can do things to shape culture. And this includes your empathy. Who you empathize with and who you don't is informed by the narratives and the ideas floating around in your wider culture. But we're no slaves to that. We have a say in what that culture is and what it can be. So here's an example. My father-in-law once, once asked me, and he's by no means the only one, how do the Northern Irish tell each other apart to be mad at each other? A Catholic and a Protestant walk down a Belfast street. How do they know to get nervous or protect themselves? How can they tell that the, the group uh, how can they tell the group that the other person walking belongs to? My father-in-law and others ask me this because they're American. In America, we're used to thinking about prejudice in terms of skin tone, of indicators of group identity that are overtly visible. We take different shades in our skin to indicate something about our racial associations. In America, prejudice needs pigmentation. But that's a cultural thing. That's not the case in Northern Ireland. There they have indicators and markers they constantly look for. Uh, the, the, the name, their names, the little bits in their accent, the, the schools and the streets they're familiar with. More subtle than ours, but that make very clear to them all on first meeting and sometimes on first sight what side of the Catholic-Protestant divide a person lives on. There's nothing in nature that sets Catholics and Protestants at war with each other in this little pocket of the world. How could there be? Catholic and Protestant are themselves social inventions. In the same way, there's nothing about American forms of prejudice that are inherently natural either. We make up those lines of divisions, those indicators, and just perpetuate them by maintaining them collectively together in the culture. The call for empathy then entails more than just calling for you as an individual inside your own head to shift around the shape of empathy in there. It's also necessarily a call for reworking our culture. Just one aspect of which our nation's socially constructed lines of prejudice and all the indicators in America, for example, the interpretation of skin tone that those lines of prejudice rely on. And sometimes, my third point, this act of reworking culture actually happens through real processes of dialogue and empathy. Lines of division in Northern Ireland, lines of division in arguably any society, are both defined and in encouraged to some degree by the way different groups interpret the world they share in different and often contesting ways. Famously, it's hard to find anything Catholics and Protestants read in the same way. I've been using, for example, throughout this whole talk, the distinctions Catholic and Protestant, and that suggests some kind of religious conflict. To many Catholics, though, religion has nothing to do with it. Many Catholics in Northern Ireland aren't even Catholic. They don't do the rites, they don't go to church, and they don't believe in God. It's just a designation of group identity. Ask Protestants, and you're way more likely to hear that religion has everything to do with it. The roots of the conflict lie across Europe in Rome, they say. The whole fight is about Catholics trying to rid the island of Protestantism. The whole fight is another thing they don't really agree on. The Catholic side always say it was the last press against British colonialism. Protestants have always seen it as Catholic. Uh, Catholic forces trying to ethnically cleanse them, to push them out into the sea. Their metaphors tend to be Northern Ireland as a last fortress against encroaching Catholic power. They wave different flags. The Union Jack to Protestants is a symbol of unity and strength. 
To many Catholics, it's a symbol of four centuries of, opp of oppression. The tricolor flag of the Republic of Ireland is to Catholics the flag of home. To many Protestants, it's a symbol of terrorism. Soccer, to many Protestants, is the world's favorite sport. To many Catholics, it's an example of how their Gaelic culture has been eclipsed. Protestants associate with orange, Catholics with green. The second largest city in the country is Derry to Catholics, its more ancient name, but Londonderry to Protestants. Or sometimes Londonderry slash Derry altogether in a failed attempt to sidestep this problem of everything being read through two competing perspectives. For the Protestants, it's the Belfast Peace Agreement. For the Catholics, it's named the Good Friday Agreement. Even the name of the region they live in. For decades, Catholics wouldn't grant it its own name. They simply called it the North of the Island. Protestants will call it Northern Ireland, but they like to call it Ulster as well. All of which would be entirely fine, would just be human difference, except there's a lot of animosity around all those competing interpretations. They are, by the way, some of the indicators of which you, you show whether you're side with Catholics or Protestants. As an outsider, there's really no winning on this. I've had Protestants rip into me for saying the name Derry, and Catholics dismiss me when they find out that I love soccer. You can imagine that makes crossing their divides for peace talks or for generally living together particularly difficult. They don't quite share a common language. They read history and each other differently. In some ways, they live in different worlds. A Catholic community worker once explained to me then the kinds of seemingly small but profoundly important little negotiations each side started to make as they worked genuinely for peace. Catholics, he explained, used to holler Brits out. It was a Catholic slogan, graffitied across peace walls everywhere. Eventually, as the two groups tentatively stretched out their divides, stretched across their divides, uh, this man's community group asked Protestants, what do you want from us? And the Protestants replied, the first thing they said, stop saying Brits out. So the Catholics couldn't understand why. They weren't referring to the Protestants. They meant the English when they said Brits out, who for decades controlled the government and kept an army there. But what the Catholics didn't understand was that the Protestants identified deeply as British themselves. When the Protestants heard Brits out, it just confirmed their read of the war. This was ethnic cleansing, Catholics trying to push them out into the sea. Because Catholics understood their war as an attempt to slough off British power, they had no idea their Brit out slogan was landing on Protestant hearts to wound them. They had no idea how each group was reading what the other was doing until they talked to each other and genuinely talked to each other, opened their ears and listened. So what did you do, I asked the man. Well, we stopped using it, he said. We being all Catholics. Like that, they, they changed their collective cultural activity. This act of conscious listening to Catholics, patiently, steadily, with open ears enough to hear new interpretations, is a great example of the hard work of empathy the work that, that's let Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland steadily, inch by inch, with much still to be done, bridge the divides that separate them. And now that my script is over, I don't have a conclusion. And when I came in here, I was worried about that. And now I've decided that's probably right. I started with America. I thought I should go back. But I think maybe that's your task. Uh, underlying all this, I've tried to suggest that in my own life, over the last two or three years, the more I look at America, the more I see the same dynamics that I just described not quite to the, to the same levels of blood, but a kind of splitting going on. I might be wrong about that. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Uh, do we have questions? Do we have time for questions? Thank you.